Um, thank you, first of all, to uh, everyone who's joined us um, for the stress-free GRC session. Uh, as anyone who's been to these sessions will know uh, from previous sessions, we record the first 30 minutes and then we stop the recording and then it's open questions uh, for everyone else. You are obviously encouraged to ask questions if you feel brave enough and you want to ask questions, that's fine. But just so you're aware, the first 30 minutes are recorded and we do share those on social media. So first, a um, few house rules as we, um, as we always do. It's a safe place and Chatham House rules apply, meaning that what we discuss here stays here. Uh, uh, very particularly around those last 30 minutes. So feel free to share any of your personal experiences and thoughts and insights around the topic that we're going to discuss. Um, this is not a place for sales. So we're not here to push uh, products or a particular service as such. Uh, Tim, who I'm going to introduce to you in a second or two, has kindly offered his time to come and talk about a particular specialism and a particular uh, area that I think is of interest to us all in data protection and info security. And the final kind of rule, if it needs to be a rule, is remember to be kind and professional at all times. Um, we've never had any issues, but I have no problem with kicking anyone out uh, who's rude, um, but we've never had any problems previously. So I'm sure that won't, uh, that won't be the case. So, uh, with all of that said, can I uh, again just just remind you if you wish to put yourselves on on mute and turn your cameras off, that's great. And do ask um, any questions of Tim uh, or anyone else on the chat. So today, um, first of all, Tim, thank you ever so much for giving your time up. Nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Um, so we're going to focus today on a, a topic which is, has started to dominate um, quite a few conversations online around information security. And there's a lot of interest around behavioral science. Uh, and in particular, a word uh, has started to emerge over recent months um, uh, called nudge, which I think you know a thing or two about. Um, so. I've invited you along today to talk about nudge theory, what it is and how we can apply it in our roles as information security and data protection practitioners. Um, Recognising you aren't a info security practitioner yourself, so you're coming at this very much from a particular expertise in nudge theory. Um, and with that, can I just ask you to just introduce who you are and who MindFlick are and what you do, and then we'll dive into uh, your presentation, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so just first of all, just to say hello to everyone. But um, my so my my background myself. So I'm a uh, by trade, I'm a sports psychologist or a performance psychologist. Um, for a lot of my career, I've worked in uh, elite sports. So worked with Olympic sports and professional sports as a as a performance psychologist. Um, and Mindfleet was created really to take um, so um, to take the lessons from performance psychology and make them more accessible for more people. And the the whole, I suppose where the business name. So a couple of people were mentioning around the name Mindfleet. Um, the business name where the business name came from was the idea around helping people see things from different perspectives to help create change really quickly. So my Netflix always been interested in psychology that creates genuine impact. So performance psychology as a discipline is about creating change. Um, and in particular, my Netflix, we're really interested in how do you create change really quickly? And one of the areas of psychology where, um, they get this really, really right, is nudge psychology. So nudge psychology essentially is about making small changes to have a really, really big impact, often at scale. Um, so yeah, that's a bit about a bit about me and a bit about about, about my background. Do you, want, do you want me just to play on, Gary? Or... Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, that would be yeah. good. Oh, so I'm just going to share, hopefully. Yeah, we can see that. Perfect. Let me just get rid of Zoom's now in the way. Two secs. Where are we? Let me get 
presenter be on. There we go. Cool. Perfect. So, um, yeah. So, just to, I suppose just to share a bit a bit of added background about myself. So, my um, my PhD um, when when I was based in when I was based at the Institute of Sports, so I was part of the psychology team at the Institute of Sport, and my PhD was looking at how do we apply nudges uh, in a sport environment, and at the time. Um, basically we explored all the different areas of psychology that have helped create change quick the idea being like in sport when you face a problem when a team gets stuck when an individual gets stuck the the, the need to create change fast becomes a, a performance benefit if you're three weeks away from an olympic games and feel stuck the ability to help someone get unstuck and create change fast is, is a is a need to have in sports so my phd was looking at small interventions to create change fast and as part of the PhD, one of the areas of psychology that we got really into was was the stuff that I'm going to share with you today. So I suppose I'm going to share with you a background and history to nudge psychology. Um, I'm going to share some examples of nudging in action. So the best way of bringing nudge to life often is sharing nudges in action. And then finally, just just I suppose share a little bit of a a bit of a framework for practical application because nudges is it it crosses all disciplines as gary said my my background is sport and performance work a lot in business now um but the application of no psychology is basically helpful for anyone who's trying to create behavior change and and that is the vast majority of people and so when i worked in sport i would very often help people in the sports science team um help them create change in some of the athletes as well so and this is one of the things that but often uses a bit of a framework to help them. So I'll share, I'll share a bit of an example towards the end, and hopefully that has some application for you as well on, on the call. Um, Thank you. So um, the background to nudge itself. So uh, the, the the word nudge was popularized by a book written by these two chaps here. So this is uh, on the left-hand side, a guy called Richard Faller. On the right-hand side, a guy called Cass Sunstein. Um, and in 2008, they wrote a book called Nudge. And basically what they and neither of these the neither of these two individuals are psychologists, neither of these two individuals are behavioral scientists. Um, but what they what they wrote this book about and what they were with were, were um I suppose trying to stimulate some thought towards is that the way that um the way that our laws are written, the way that our policies are shaped, and the way that people approach behavior change typically are not done in how the brain actually works. And so fundamentally, their book is based on the psychology um, that underpins the only psychologist to ever win the Nobel Prize. There's a guy called Daniel Kahneman. And Daniel Kahneman has spent his career to basically demonstrate that human beings are not rational creatures. Um, but the thing that he showed is that the way that we're not rational is somewhat predictable. So we're kind of like predictably irrational. Yeah, as um as as Fowler and Sunstein's book kind of showed is like the way that we then design internal policies, um, policies at a nation at a national level, the way we write laws, they're written in with them with the thought that the human beings are rational, that the brain works logically all the time. So what they they uh, ask people to do is people who are writing policies, who are thinking about behavior change to do so in mind with how the brain actually works and the one the nudge that they that i suppose captures a lot of interest and i'm sure you'll either have come across this nudge heard this story before um it is the is the nudge that was based at skipple airport so skipple airport was the new airport built built uh, in amsterdam and skipple was designed to basically be the you know to give an, an amazing first impression of the of the Netherlands. So as you arrive into Amsterdam, the airport being such an impressive airport that your first impression as you come into the country being one of like really well designed, beautifully clean. Um and they had basically had one one area in which they had a problem with cleanliness in the airport, which was the gents toilet. And in the gents toilet, it was very politely put, they had a spillage problem. So there's a spillage problem in the in the gents uh, toilet. And you can imagine classically the approach to solve this problem, and this is the classic approach to most problems, is you go down one of two routes. You assume that people don't care enough 
So therefore you go down the route of we need to motivate or you assume that people don't understand enough. Therefore you go down the route of educate. So most interventions, when people are trying to create behavior change, fall into those two buckets, educate people because they don't know enough or motivate people because they don't care enough. So you can imagine a whole you know, list of different interventions. So to create people to be more proud of the environment, make it look nicer, put nice smells into the bathroom. You could imagine loads of educational posters, um, slogans as you go into the toilet to make to improve this problem. But this this actual problem was solved overnight, instantly, by an engineer who decided they would etch a little fly into every every urinal, and straight away their spillage problem overnight disappeared. So in terms of behavior change, that is rapid behavior change. That is behavior change overnight on scale. Um. And I suppose like just the, the this this idea itself caught, caught that if you take a step back from that, the ability to create change really quickly with a very literally a very small intervention um, is what nudge psychology is about. But the the really key thing from a very pure point of view around nudge psychology is that nudge psychology is about choice architecture, which is a very harsh way of saying it's thinking about how you shape the environment. So a nudge, technically a nudge can't, can't change or restrict the choice that people have. That isn't a nudge. That would be, a, you know, that would be a shove or a push. A nudge, so a nudge can't change or restrict. So in the bathroom, for instance, people can still miss the ball, still have the choice to miss the ball. So it isn't about restricting or changing the choice, but it's about using the environment and how we frame choices to encourage positive behaviors, the behaviors that we want to see. So a large part of the book written by Fowler and Sunstein was talking about almost the philosophy of this choice architecture. If you know that little things make a difference and how you position things, how you frame things will influence people's choices. Well, as the choice architecture, as the choice architect, the person who's designing that intervention, well, you've got certain choices to make around what, you know, what behaviors you want to shape. And some of the examples will bring that to life. And it's actually for this reason as well. If you want a bit of nudge nerdiness, um, for this reason, a lot of kind of, I suppose, academics uh, in the area of nudge psychology don't actually describe nudge as a theory per se. They describe it as an approach to psychology because the reality is everything is a nudge. So if you think about it, your current environment you're sat in now, you, the way you set your kitchen up, the way you set your office up will shape every bit of your behavior. Your behavior is constantly being in, influenced by what's going on around you. And what a nudge is about is about purposefully shaping some of that to create the desired outcome that you want. So I'll give you a little a, a little example again of mass behavior change overnight. So the way in which um, societies uh, create a, a organ donation list, so people who are willing to donate their organs, is when you uh, sign up for your driving license, you choose to say, I would like to be an organ donor should an accident happen. And in countries and societies that, Say when you, as you're doing your driving license, you tick a box to say yes, I'd like to donate my organs. Uh, on average, about twenty percent of people, so about one in five of us, say I'd like to donate my organs. Um, what they did is when 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 they flip this to be opt out, so the box is already ticked. So now I have to untick it to say I don't want to donate my organs. So the choice isn't changed. I can still choose to opt in. I can choose to opt out. That, that figure goes from about 20% to about 80%. So from one in five to about four in five. Overnight, huge amount of behavior change for a very pro-social behavior. Um, and basically what they've demonstrated is a couple of things is the brain goes with what the default is. So we often go with the default option is number one. And two is that we like to fit in with what the norm is. So it being ticked suggests that's what most people do. So human beings want to fit in, want to follow others, and therefore this the massive amount of behavior change overnight. Um, a second example, building on this one, so building on the idea around using social norms in order... Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. One sec. Um, on a, yeah, on a, on a, on a social, on, on, uh, using social psychology is that... Um, in in an area in America, they wanted to reduce the uh, the power, the the use of electricity and gas in a certain area. And what they decided to do was they would, as people got their bills for their gas and electricity, 
they decided that they would share their um they would share the norm in their area so you would say right this month you've used 500 kilowatts the average in your area has been 400 kilowatts so they'd share the social norm at the start of the, the, the letter so the simplest thing choice doesn't change and what they found was when you share the social norm so in your area that the average is 400 use 500 people who were over the average next month would reduce their electricity and gas unfortunately when they did this there was a reverse effect which was people who were under increased their amount of gas and electricity so overall at a group level the, the amount of gas electricity used didn't change so what they decided to then do is then change the letter again um to then also put if someone was under they'd receive a smiley face if someone was over they'd receive an unhappy face and just the smallest little symbol of a smiley face and an unhappy face meant that people were over they'd reduce the next month and people who were under maintain being under so small things to promote social norms make a big change on behavior again there's other ways in nudge psychology has been applied which is about how we frame choices as well so things like in all in like all you can eat buffets or you can eat restaurants making plates smaller means that people eat less so simply just by making the plate smaller people take less people eat less and make healthier choices in environments where in cafeterias whatever you put on the front row whatever you put in this row here with the carrots here will get disproportionately picked than the stuff that's put on row two and row three no matter what you put in the three rows the thing that's on the front row always get picked more so again, so if you know that as the uh, cafeteria uh, uh, person who's putting out the stuff in the cafeteria, then you've got decisions to make. So do I put out stuff at the front that is healthier? Do I make the decision on putting stuff out that makes me more profit? Do I put stuff out that I've got more left over in the kitchen? So you've got a choice to make. As soon as you know that's influencing, you've got a choice to make in terms of how you shape the environment to create the behaviors that you want. And it's the same for anyone who likes going to restaurants on a menu um whatever's at the top of a menu and whatever's at the bottom of a menu uh get disproportionately picked so people's behaviors and choices get disproportionately swung towards the thing that's at the top and the thing that's at the bottom so again the person the, uh, the person designing the menu has got a choice to make when they know that do i put stuff that makes me more profit stuff that's healthier stuff we're running out of etc etc so little things make a big difference in terms of how we frame um how we frame them so this this uh this one here is a really simple one, which is um when you've got two bins like this that say one says rubbish, one say recycle. Generally, people don't pause to think and they just use both bins um or or disproportionately just use the rubbish bin. As soon as you change that to be landfill versus recycle, it causes people to pause, causes their automatic brain to slow down and actually make a decision about what they're gonna do. It has a bit more of a shock factor um this is a lovely example of, of of using a bit of framing as well as a bit of the environment so uh this park here had a problem with people smoking and throwing the butts on the floor so the area in which got the most uh, <laughs> uh butts being thrown on the floor they put a bin where people smoked first of all and then they made it a bit of fun by putting, making it in a vote a vote for who the, the best uh, footballer in the world was uh this one not sure if it's a nudge but i just quite liked it encouraging people to use the bin um this one's a really good one and i'm sure there's probably what you can think of some application of this one so uh, it's called the watching eyes nudge which basically um if you put a pair of what this was originally done this was originally done to reduce the theft of bikes in shared bike areas so if you put a, a pair of watching eyes by a bike shed the number of bike thefts go down just by putting a pair of watching eyes near them and what they've since replicated is basically any pro-social behavior, something that's like about doing something for someone else, can be increased by putting a pair of watching eyes by that. So if you put a pair of watching eyes by a charity box, the amount that people donate goes up by about three times. If you put a pair of watching eyes, if you want a bit of application in the office, if you put a pair of watching eyes by the shared kitchen, it prevents people piling up pots waiting for someone else to uh, waiting for someone else to wash them. So uh, watching eyes creates the sense of a little reminder that people are always aware of your actions are always being watched and therefore prevents theft, increases pro-social behavior. 
Uh, again, this is just another one I quite like. So um, when you go to a coffee shop, you get a stamp to say, you know, once you've completed this card, you'll um, uh, you'll get free coffee. But coffee shops, um, what they found is if you if you had a if you had a card that had uh, say use this example, if you had a card that had uh, nine empty spaces until you got your free coffee, or you had a space that had eleven empty spaces, but I gave you the first two for free. So the same amount that you required people come back to the coffee shop quicker when they get given the two first two for free and it's a bit of psychology called the endowment effect which is basically when you feel invested in something you keep going back to it so a simple example of this day to day is if any of you um make a to-do list and you start your to-do list with two or three things you've already done that is an example of the endowment effect in action it creates momentum into your day it feels like you're committed and the um to something already um nudges were used during the pandemic so this is a hospital where they wanted what they realized is people going to see their family members in hospital um were required to use the hand sanitizers and the hand gels and they found that only three percent sounds crazy but only three percent of people were using the hand sanitizers before going to see their family members the first thing they did was they moved it to be really obvious on your way in and they found that rather than being stuck on a wall behind a corner, you just put it in people's face here, it goes from 3% to 20%. So that change in behavior shows it's not about people not wanting to do it. It's just about the clarity of what I'm being asked to do. The really cool thing is that then they then did this. They then changed the sign to say, here, we use hand disinfectant. So it's a social norm. Here, how we act here is this. And then in order to protect your relative. So they also had a, a shock factor in there. And when they did that, the sign plus the play, placement, the amount of visitors using the hand sanitizer shot up again. So it's a nearly 70%. So no fancy intervention, no change of choice, literally just moving where it is and changing the sign leads to a big change in behavior. Um, not just to increase stay use or blocking people, stopping people from um kind of blocking the escalators really common so you see things like this to create prevention of cues just help people to use one side to move down or the right hand side to stay still or encourage people to use the stairs um i'm slightly mindful of time so i was going to do this as a mini task but i'll not do this but people can use nudge psychology to increase safety on stairs as well so going up and down stairs in office environments is a is uh, the reason why it's often a risky behavior is because people don't use the handrail and are often distracted. You're often doing something else. So um, what this one uh, one organization decided to do was to put these small signs at the bottom, <laughs> small um, <laughs> images at the bottom of stairs. And what they found was um, the number of people using um, the handrails went up from about 35% to about 45%. And what they actually thought was that that was a bit like a joke nudge that it creates a bit of a shock factor, but after time people will ignore it because it's just, it's just there. But they went back um, three months later and they found that actually behavior change had gone up even a little bit more again. So it's stuck. So these things aren't just kind of like, right, once you've seen them once it then goes back to what it was, these things hold. Um, so this is the bit that I suppose has a bit of application. So that's that's a little bit of history, a little bit of it, um, some examples. This is the bit about like how do you apply some of that thinking to your own interventions? Um, and this framework here, they call this the East framework. When um, because of how cost effective nudge psychology is, uh, both David Cameron and, and Barack Obama brought a nudge team into their governments, and the behavioral insights team as part of David Cameron's government created this framework yeah, which was called east uh, and it's basically like they 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 bring this to life in lots of different examples how how i use this with um other practitioners working in sport other people that i've worked with is just asking yourself four really simple questions about your intervention so if you're trying to create behavior change if you're trying to uh, get people to be more secure with their passwords if you're getting trying to get people to be better in how so a current mindful one that gary on know about is we're you know currently getting people trying to get people to shut down their laptops more often so you take what you're trying to get people to do you think about your current intervention and you ask yourself four questions so the first one is 
could you make it any easier to do the required behavior? So really what we're saying there is, could you use defaults or could you reduce the hassle factor? So if you think about the examples I've shared here of, of the make it easy, the um, the organ donation, make it easy is you have to opt out. So it's literally there already done. The hassle factor would be the example of the hospital. So don't make the hand sanitizer hidden somewhere. Just put it where you come in. So can you reduce the hassle factor or make it as easy as possible? Attractive is your message, is your thing that you're trying to do really, really obvious, memorable, and the benefits clearly explained. So can you attract attention and make it obvious? So our hospital example did a little bit of this one as well, made the sign really clear, made it very um, memorable and, and uh, had that kind of shock factor to it. A little bit like the bin as well. Can you make it social? So can you either make it a group activity or something that you do with others? I can you use social pressure. So social pressure can be by sharing social norms or it can be by, right, we're doing this together. So anyone who knows about um, trying to stick to a gym routine, it's really hard. Until then, you have got you do it with someone else. And until you, you go start going to the gym with someone else, you'll know that it's a lot easier because basically you feel guilty about letting them down and it forces you to the gym and then you feel better for it. That's social pressure in action. So if you can think about how you make your activity social, um, that's what another part of this frame. And then finally, timely. And what timely basically means is how might you put in reminders nearer to the time of the required behavior? And what this is basically a little reminder for you is the danger we get into when we're trying to create interventions is we fall into people don't care, people don't know enough, people aren't motivated. So we, we assume people just don't know or aren't, you know, aren't, aren't bothered. But actually, the reality is people forget an intention is quite often rarely the problem. So the NHS example of this is brilliant. The NHS had um, um, a significant amount of missed appointments. When they brought in the text scheme where you got a text reminder, the day before and the day of your appointment, it massively, massively transformed overnight the number of people missing appointments. So clearly it wasn't a, I don't know when my appointment is. It's not, I don't want to come. It's that people just need to be reminded at the point in which you want people to do the behavior. So can you make your intervention as timely as possible? So this was the application, I suppose, to take away from this is these four really simple questions to ask yourself when you're thinking about an intervention. Could you make it any easier to do what you want people to do? Is your message really memorable and the benefits clearly explained? Can you make it a group activity or something you do with others? And how might you put in reminders near the time of the required behavior? So um, I'll, I'll just, just to show how this can be applied to like everything, any intervention, I'll give you a classic example of a problem uh, in a sports team. So sports teams have multiple, multiple people supporting them from different sports science um, disciplines. And everyone is trying to do their own little bit from their own discipline to help people. So um, one area that sports teams will have someone working in is nutrition. And in a sport I've worked with before, the nutritionist will, um, after, a, after a game, every individual athlete in a team will have certain requirements to get their level of recovery back up to their normal kind of, um, all the stuff that's going on internally for them to get them back up to their, uh, where they're, where they're normally at. Um, the new, a nutritionist can de personally design, um, a series of supplements that people need to take in order to recover. Now, um, with the danger of this is you, so, um, if I, if I was to give every one of these lads here a series of supplements in order to take after the game, which they'd have to mix in with their water. So I know that they care about the performance. I know they want to do best for themselves. I know it's really well thought out. They know it's personalized. The danger of that would be staying in their sports bags. And that's what, you know, very often nutritionists will find. I'll go, but this beautiful intervention together. I designed a personalized um, series of supplements for people to take after the game yet they just don't do it. They leave it in the bag and it's incredibly frustrating. So we came to we came to these four questions with that very problem. So how can what, what can we do um, with that intervention? So what we decided is um, the things around that. Is, so currently the, the supplements were being given to players before a game and they were being, being given to them to add to their water and assuming that they would mem you know, mem memory to, uh, mem remember to take it at the right moment, um, you know, uh, do it in the point after a game so they get the right level of recovery. 
But what we actually did is we looked at these four questions and thought, right, actually, how do we make it? Um, how do we make it really, really easy? So every player, rather than giving them a little bag of personalized supplements, their supplements got instantly added to their water bottles. And their water bottles had their name on. And their water bottles were then given to them after the game by staff. So the, the, the bits that this connects into so far is um, make it really easy. So make it, you know, you don't have to mix your own stuff, but it's really easy and it's really timely. I'm going to give it you after the game. The bit that we did to then make it social and memorable is we had an out when empty policy. So the bit where everyone always has to do, because it's the team that has to do it, after a game, everyone has to get in the ice baths and every member of staff would then give them their water bowl in the ice bath and we had a we had a principle of out when empty. So you can only get out of the ice bath once your water bottle is empty, once you've finished. Um, <laughs> so super easy, super attractive, memorable, as in I know why I'm doing it. It's memorable. It's part of a group activity, something we do together now. And it's really timely. Someone's going to give it to you at the point you need it. So a really simple example, but it shows how you can take any form of intervention, any behavior change you're trying to create and change your intervention to subtly change it to make it more sticky. And that's just the application of the the, the East principles. So that is uh I've just gone over time. So I've done all right. It's quite good for me. Um that that that's that's, that's me really. I, just to share, so finally, uh, if anyone's interested in further reading, um so I've mentioned the the book Nudge by uh Fowler and Sunstein. There's a book called Switch. Uh, by Chip and Dan Heath, so the Heath brothers. And this book basically is another book designed for people trying to create behavior change. And the way it links into nudge psychology is they talk about classic um, behavior change interventions, try to basically educate or motivate. And they use the metaphor of a rider and an elephant. So the elephant represent the emotional part of the brain, the rider represent in the logical part of the brain. And that ultimately the emotional bit will trump the rider if uh, if not well managed. But but what they do talk about is then the path and that the fact that the elephant and the rider will often just follow the path, which basically represents your environment, your context. So thinking about the environment context, it gives some nice tips in there. Um, pig wrestling. So my colleagues here at Mindflake have written, uh, written a book called Pig Wrestling, which is based on some of the psychology of my PhD um, and also is around problem solving. So how you make sure you take the right problem on to start off with. And then from an academic perspective, the, there's a Danish um, there's a Danish academic called Pelle Hansen who uh, publishes a lot of papers on nudge psychology. And then this is the ETH framework by the Behavioral Insights team, which I've shared with you today, um, which is, I think, free to access as well uh, through their website as well. So a few bits of further reading there as well. Brilliant. And that's me. Thank you ever so much. That was Brilliant. Um, obviously, Tim, well, obviously for you and I, we work together. Um, you're one of our clients and um, all those books that you've suggested there, I could highly recommend uh, guided by you. I've, I've already read all of those books. The pig wrestling one is um, is brilliant. It's a, um, I think the phrase you use is a business fable, which was really interesting. Um, it's a really different approach. So yeah, I can highly recommend all of those books. Um, uh, so yeah, but no, thank you for that. And, um, we've got, we have got a few questions. So, um, but before we dive into the questions, uh, as I've said before, um, for those who are watching this on YouTube, on social media and such, you get access to Tim's uh, knowledge and expertise on that presentation, but unfortunately not the questions. So we're going to stop the recording now. So thanks to everyone for watching. If you've been watching online, um, if you want to participate and ask questions, then, um, well, you've got to be here. Uh, so, um, you know, if you're not here, you miss out. So there you go. So I'm going to stop the recording now. And um, 